million stars in the Milky Way. That's more than 12 times the number of people on Earth. Do you want to know a secret? Every star you see shining in the night sky is a dream of someone down on Earth. That's why we wish upon the stars, so that the star seekers, the protectors of our dreams, can keep them safe and burning bright. But sometimes we can forget to dream, and sometimes we just need a little help to keep those dreams alive. Thomas Coates and Margaret Glenn had ten children. The most spirited was their daughter, Janet. Both obsessed with books and adventures, Thomas and Janet looked up to the stars and Janet would wish that they would always be together. Over the years, the Coates Threadmill became very successful and Thomas used his wealth to give back to his hometown, Paisley, building the fountain gardens and a playground for the school. His final gift was the Coates Observatory, opening on the 1st of October 1883. Unfortunately, two weeks later Thomas passed away. A horrible man, Lord Ernest Hamilton ruled over the town and slowly the whole of Paisley became grey and sad. Janet longed to be close to her father, so every evening for a year she visited the observatory. Janet began her journey from her home at Fergusley House passing workers as they filtered out from the Coates Mill. She meandered into town, past the new town hall with its towering columns, stopping on Moss Street outside her favourite shop. As always, she paused outside to give a young homeless boy a coin before pushing open the door to the bookshop run by the mad MacDougall brothers. Pluto the cat jumped down from the bookcase in his usual greeting. Janet picked up a new arrival, August Strindberg's Getting Married. Picking up some tips, are you, Janet? Pardon? Yon book there. Congrats on your... Uh, what's it? Engagement? No. Betrothal? Not that one. Espousal? The plight of your truth. Oh, very nice, Martin. Why, thank you, Mackenzie. Just the book, please, gentlemen. Of course, ma'am. This one's on us. For your order. Janet smiled. This wasn't the first time she'd received a free book from the brothers. It seems I'm about your only customer these days. You really must let me pay for this book. Well, aye. Business is tough, the new. No other folk reading as there was. But we insist, my dear. Mackenzie pouted as Martin pushed the book enthusiastically into her hands. Have a bonny thing, me bob. Night? No. Evening? Eh... Crepuscule! Martin bellowed as the door swung shut behind her. She began the steep ascent up the hill to the observatory, arriving at 7pm like clockwork. She nodded to the curator, leaving for the night, and nestled into her usual spot to read. She put aside her new book in favour of a dirty, leather-bound notebook belonging to her father, rereading the same nonsense sentences and random coordinates, trying to make sense of what he had written. She looked at her locket. She'd all but given up hope of solving the riddles, but her fiancé, James Tate, convinced her to have one final try while he was away, before their wedding next month. She looked up to the stars for a sign from her father. Oh, come on, Dad. A little help here? Janet sighed closed the book and left the observatory. She was wasting her time, she decided. Her father's scribbles were nothing more than an old man's gibberish. Janet saw a bright light shoot across the sky and crash into the observatory. She rushed back inside, but there was no sign of any damage. She heard a noise. Something was moving around in the dark corners of the room. Is somebody there? A little girl sat in the shadows, curled into a tight ball. Oh, are you okay there, lass? The girl did not respond. Are you lost, wee one? What's your name? I... 
can't remember. You can't remember your own name. The girl nodded her head, beginning to unfurl. Well, my name is Janet. How about you come back with me and I put out word to find your parents? I don't think I have any parents. Janet's heart sank. The poor little girl was an orphan. Janet offered her hand. You can trust me. The little girl took Janet's hand and walked with her back to Janet's home in Fergusley Park. They didn't speak much. The little girl seemed confused, and Janet didn't know what to say, but she knew from the strange symbol imprinted on her chest that this girl was different. They turned the corner onto Well Street and collided into a tall, imposing man. He towered over them. Long, bony fingers wrapped around a heavy metal cane. Watch where you're going, woman. A menacing black raven came to rest on the man's shoulder. He petted it soothingly. Hush now, Odin. Apologies, Lord Hamilton. You coats are just as bad as the clerks, only thinking about yourselves. Taking in street urchins now, are we? How charitable. I'm just trying to help her. The poor thing is lost. Parents probably left her on purpose. Filthy me, rat. The little girl lunged at him, fists ready to attack. Who are you calling rat? Odin pecked his beak at her, squawking loudly. Janet pulled her back. Hey, now. It's okay. Make sure and cage that beast, or I'll have her spend some time behind real prison bars. Janet tried to smile politely, but her insides burned with rage. Since Hamilton had become Paisley's MP after her father died, he'd outlawed homelessness and put taxes so high the whole town was struggling. Good night, Lord Hamilton. Janet steered the little girl past the bony old man, ducking as Odin circled overhead. What a horrible man. Oh, to think my father used to be friends with him. Vermin. Pale moonlight shone through the windows as they sat warming their hands by the fire. So, you don't remember anything about yourself? I think I fell. From where? The little girl shrugged. Janet placed her father's notebook on the mantelpiece beside an unusual rock. Can I see that? The notebook? Oh, no, I, I don't think... No, the rock. Oh, um, yes, I suppose so. The little girl turned the rock over in her hands, fascinated. My father left it to me when he passed, but I haven't the foggiest idea why. I know this rock. We have to take it back. Take what? Where? This rock. To the stars. Janet burst out laughing, but the little girl remained serious. <laughs> You've got a very vivid imagination, I'll give you that. I remember my name. Epsilon, of the Sagittarius constellation, but everyone calls me silly. I remember being struck by a bright light, falling through space. This rock is from my galaxy, and we have to take it back. Okay, silly. Say all of this space nonsense is true. I can't give you my rock. All my father left me was that rock and a, a notebook with stupid riddles. It's all I have left. Can I see the book? Janet handed her the notebook. Have you ever wondered if these riddles were clues? What for? To find other dream rocks. And these are the coordinates for which star to return them to. <laughs> I think too much cocoa has gone to your head, little one. Time to call it a night. Janet marched upstairs and fell into bed. She woke with the sunrise, wondering if last night had all been a bizarre dream. Had she really met a little orphan girl from the stars? She came downstairs and stopped outside the parlour room, hearing a voice. She opened the door to find Silly on the floor with her father's notebook, reciting one of the riddles. Is there a bookshop near here? Um, McDougall Brothers on Moss Street. Why? My spine is stiff, my body pale. I'm waiting to tell you a tale. Among my friends, we sit and wait, with brothers too, who keep the gate. Oh, you think that means the bookshop? Well, do they have any unfulfilled dreams? Um, well, the shop has been rather quiet of late. 
Mackenzie told me they might have to shut for good. Silly grinned. It was the same grin Janet's father used to have before he proposed a crazy adventure. Good afternoon, Janet. And friend. Can we help you? Hello, Mackenzie. Yes. We're looking for... Um, Weekend. Also known as a flank. Thank you, Martin. Yes. Um, maybe you have something like that. Something sturdy, like a... Um, rock! Silly shouted, pointing to a little rock sitting on a high shelf beside Pluto. Oh, that's not really for sale. More decoration. We're a bookshop, not a bookend shop. Could you show it to me? Mackenzie handed Janet the rock. As I say, it's just a rock, Miss Coates. Do you wish there were more customers in your shop? Mackenzie McDougall turned to Silly, lit up as if suddenly injected with positivity. Well, of course we do, little miss. The whole reason we set up this wee bookshop was to share our love of books with the whole of Paisley. Silly placed a small hand on Mackenzie's arm, the symbol on her chest glowing softly. What is it you love so much about Bix? Where to begin, little miss? <clears throat> Romance with Austin, laugh with Twain, lose yourself in bunch of A Dickens tale, a Shakespeare show, some gloomy verse with Alan Poe. There's Oscar Wilde and Walter Scott to while the hours deep in thought. We've got them all, come take a look. Find a nook, don't be a mook. And read a book. Oh, Martin, your vocal cords are enough to make anybody smile. Kenzie's gone. As the brothers congratulated themselves, their dream rock glowed in Janet's hands. Silly quietly slipped it into her pocket. Have you ever thought about reaching out to the young people here? Showing them your love for stories? We could run a young readers group here in the shop. Introduce them to the greats. Get them writing their own stories. A charge for those who can afford it and free to those who can eh? Everyone brought together by the magic of books. Oh, Miss Coates, that's a brilliant... What's it called? Idea? No. Suggestion? Not the one. Plan? Conceptualisation. Janet and Silly slipped out of the shop as the brothers excitedly discussed their plans. A satisfied feeling of warmth spread through Janet's chest. Now, to put this back where it belongs. Mm. In the observatory, they positioned themselves under the telescope. Janet stared at Silly warily. So what do we... Line up the telescope with the matching coordinates. Make sure it's polar aligned. We don't want to end up in the wrong galaxy. Right ascension, 17 hours, 45 minutes. Declination, minus 29 degrees precisely. She clicked the circles into place, and a sudden gust of wind swept through the room. Janet looked to Silly, who was suddenly glowing. Electric blue hues radiating from her, just like the rock. Her hair was wild, with the coordinates dancing around her, and the symbol on her chest pulsed and shone brightly. Janet stood motionless, in shock. Take my hand. You can trust me. Janet closed her eyes and reached out to Silly. <laughs> Janet opened her eyes to never-ending vastness. They were flying, soaring through brightly coloured lights. Welcome to the Milky Way. They let go of each other and floated weightless. Janet threw her arms wide and gazed around her, completely amazed. We're really in space! Silly took Janet's hand once more and steered them towards a small cluster of dim stars. The McDougall star, and this belongs right here. Silly replaced the dream rock, and the cluster of stars burst into life. Janet stared in wonder. She looked at Silly, who was looking to the distance with a serious expression. What is that? Silly braced herself, the symbol on her chest beginning to glow. Silly, get out of here, quickly! The dreamer has to be protected. Sigma, 
What are you doing here? You both need to leave. Now. It's taken all of the other Star Seekers. I won't let it take you. Sigma beamed his light into the nothingness, but it was too strong and dragged him into its abyss. Sigma! Janet grabbed Silly's hand, and a moment later, they were back, lying on the floor of the observatory. What was that thing? What happened to that man? It's called the nothingness. It feeds on dreams. It's been taking the Star Seekers one by one. Sigma and I were the last, but now. Star Seekers? We are the protectors of dreams. I think that's why I was sent down here. The stars are burning out too fast. And the McDougal star? It's safe, for now. But we have to find and return all the missing dream rocks before the nothingness destroys every star in the sky. Your father was helping us before he died. Look at the notebook. All the entries he scored off. He wanted me to continue his work. Janet opened up the notebook. A potion master, rising grain, hailing from the northeast plain. Though none believes surpasses steam, he loves the stars and has a dream. The next morning, they set off into town, roaming around bustling Paisley, trying to solve the riddle. Tired, they sat on the steps outside the town hall. Ah, fit like coins. Who's your dues? An elderly man with a hat and suitcase suddenly appeared in front of them. Is he speaking English? Oh, aye, my wee lass. That's the Doric tongue for Aberdeen. Robert's the name, Robert Davidson. A little mouse popped out of his case. Robert wound up a little music box. Now, click your fingers with me. The mouse shuffled its tiny feet, performing a little dance. Oh, yes, baby, Moosey. So sweet. Oh. That's amazing! The mouse jumped back inside the case, and the old man slumped. Neither do anybody cares for our arm. Oh, can I interest you ladies in my latest perfume? An eau de toilette. Who'd want to smell like a toilet? Oh, oh, how about some yeast? Uh, do you need any yeast for your pantry? Our what? Uh, no, thank you. Oh. The old man sighed. Silly nudged Janet. Oh, well, perhaps we will take one of your perfumes. Oh, oh, thank you, Bonnie Quine. Uh, it's been a tough all year with the potions. Potions? Janet turned to Silly, a bell ringing in her head. You said you're from the northeast, Aberdeen? Aye, born and bred. The old man produced a loaf of bread from the inside of his jacket. Potion master, rising grain from the northeast plain. Don't suppose you're selling any rocks today, mister? Maybe something like this? Janet showed Robert her own dream rock. Oh, as the stars we hate, a dear one like that. He reached into his case and pulled out a bottle of perfume, a bag of marbles, a pocket watch, and an assortment of other random objects. Finally, he presented his dream rock. Oh, oh, I kent it was somewhere. Silly touched Robert gently on the hand, her positive energy radiating into him. Do you have any dreams, Robert? Hopes? Wishes? Oh, I do, wee quiny, I do. I'm more than just a salesman. I'm an inventor. Aye, but nobody gives a doddery old man like me the time of day. What did you invent? I made the very first electric locomotive. But Abedi said it, it would never match his steam trains. And do you want people to take your invention seriously? Oh, I dream of a day when somebody says, Robert, what you did was important. Robert, look. Robert looked at the rock, brightly glowing in his hand. <gasps> I don't believe it. Robert, we need to return that rock to the stars. Oh, you're going to attack my rock up to space? Silly nodded her head, and Robert handed it to her. I promise we'll take care of it. And Robert, never give up on your dreams. No matter how old you are. 
Robert suddenly burst into a little dance, as if a, a bolt of lightning had shot through him. They watched for a moment as Robert and his little mouse danced together in the setting sunlight. Little did they know, Lord Ernest Hamilton was close behind, watching their every movement. Again, Janet felt her whole body tingle as Silly catapulted them both into space. The dizzying colours and weightless flight made her catch her breath. It was impossibly wonderful. Silly carefully returned Robert's dream rock, and the dim stars sparkled with light once more. But time was running out, and they needed to continue their search. Janet and Silly stepped out into the chilly evening air, reading aloud the next riddle from the notebook. The History of the Devil by Daniel Defoe lays atop my table bedside. It's not what you think when you look at first blink. One mustn't judge by the outside. Don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> That's from George Eliot's Mill on the Floss, and my father and I used to read that when I was younger. Janet reached for her fiancé's locket. George Eliot was actually a woman, you know. Who? We don't get books in space. Janet laughed. Her fiancé, James, hated that a woman had to use a pseudonym to be taken seriously. She was excited to tell him of her fantastical adventures. She knew James would believe every word. The two set off back home, the new riddle spinning in Janet's head. They turned onto Moss Street, passing the McDougall Brothers bookshop. It was long closed at this time of night, but the little boy was still tucked in the doorway his small head hidden by a big book. Janet knelt down beside him. Hello. Where did you get that? The little boy looked up, and Janet pointed toward the book. George Eliot. That's very grown up. The boy gripped the book tightly. The bookshop man gave it to me, miss. I didn't steal it. Oh, no, sorry. I, I didn't mean that. Is it your dream to be a writer one day? The boy tentatively nodded his head, Silly gently touched his arm. What would you like to write? Poetry, fantasy, epic adventures. Well, I think you'll make a brilliant writer. The boy threw his arms around Janet. She froze. No one had hugged her since her father died. The boy let go and reached into his pocket, bringing out a glowing dream rock. He beamed at her. I promise we'll look after it. Janet took the rock and smiled widely at the little boy. But he had already disappeared behind the book, lost in its magical world. The next few days were spent rushing around town, solving riddles and finding rocks. They met weavers, blacksmiths, housewives and barmaids, all with stories to tell and dreams to fulfil. Silly used her powers of positivity to bring each of them new hope, making their dream rocks glow, then journeying up to space to return them to their rightful place. But all the while, the nothingness grew bigger and closer with every visit. The nothingness is moving faster than I've ever seen. Janet shivered. There's only three more riddles to solve. We have to work quickly. We don't have much time before it destroys everything we've worked for. They walked back home somberly, unaware that Lord Hamilton was right behind them, watching from the shadows. He approached the little orphan boy, who cowered in fear. Boy, tell me what you know, or it's the workhouse for you. They sat in the drawing room, a warm fire crackling beside them. Janet thought the next riddle belonged to Stuart Clark, a kind man who ran a competing thread mill in town. Everyone expects the Coates and Clarks to be enemies, but actually we're great friends. Stuart Clark is running against Lord Hamilton as Paisley's MP. Oh, at least someone's trying to free the town from his misery. The next morning, they went to the Clark Mill to find Stuart. They could hear raised voices from within his office. Someone was yelling. Either you drop out of the election, or your beautiful, smiley wife might have that grin wiped right off her face. Silly boldly opened the door. 
Stuart Clark had been forced up against the wall by Lord Hamilton, whose cane was raised threateningly in the air. Have you no manners? Interrupting two gentlemen in the middle of a meeting were you raised by wild beasts? Well, your father was a bit of a lying weasel. Don't speak about my father like that. No need to get hysterical, woman. Uh, can I help you, Janet? Lord Hamilton was just... Leaving. I don't want to spend a second longer in this dingy office. Remember what I said, Clark. <laughs> Hamilton stormed out of the office, slamming the door shut, extinguishing the candles. Stuart slumped into his chair. I'm sorry you had to see that, Miss Coates. I wasn't for a lady's eyes. But never mind a little lady. And who's this here? A, a cousin? I, I, um, niece. Cousin's niece. Oh, so uh, you're not from around here? Oh, I'm from up in Sky. Uh, Isle of Sky. A distant relative, but twice removed. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, well, um, well, what can I help you with? We're looking for a rock. It might look a little like this. Oh. Actually, one like that came crashing through my bedroom window um, about a year ago. <laughs> Nearly gave my poor wife a heart attack. <laughs> um, is there something special about it? This might sound ridiculous, but you trusted my father, didn't you? Oh, absolutely, Janet. Uh, he was a good man. The best of us. Well, he asked me to look out for you. To make sure that you don't lose sight of your dreams. My dreams? My only dream is to rescue my beloved town from that spindly Lord Hamilton. Silly reached over and touched his arm. He suddenly rose, impassioned. I just can't let him win. He treats this beautiful town with hatred. He doesn't care about people. Just money. It's not right. That rock you found, do you have it here? Stuart opened a drawer in his desk and light blazed out from inside. What is... Stuart reached into the drawer and carefully placed the shining rock on his desk. That's your dream for this town. You've made it shine again. And we need to put it back up in the stars where it can be looked after properly. In the... Sorry, what now? Am I dreaming? Can you pinch me, please? This was all too much for poor Stuart Clark. You're going to make a wonderful MP, Stuart. You've got my vote. And mine. You can't vote, silly. Lord Hamilton watched through the keyhole, astounded by the magic he'd witnessed. <laughs> he needed to get that rock. <laughs> Janet and Silly left a dumbfounded Stuart in his office, the sky beginning to darken as the sun disappeared into the horizon. Janet opened a leather notebook, ready with the next coordinates. Odin swooped down, snatching the notebook from Janet's hands. Lord Hamilton cackled as a bony hand clasped around Silly's arm, yanking her away. Janet started towards him, but he raised his cane, holding it between her and the girl. Hush now, Odin. Get your hands off her. I'd send her back to Sky, but something tells me she doesn't belong there. Don't hurt her. Tell me about your dreams, Ernest. Stop babbling nonsense, child. For the first time, Silly's powers of positivity didn't work. Lord Hamilton was too consumed by bitterness. Give me Clark's rock. No way. Give it to me, or Odin will tear your precious little book to pieces. Janet knew without the notebook they couldn't return the rocks, and the nothingness would consume all the stars in the galaxy. She sighed and took out Clark's rock. It's still glowing with hope. Hamilton grabbed it and threw it to the floor. He stamped on it, jumped on it, threw it against the wall. But whatever he did, the rock would not break. You can't destroy a dream rock. Oh, no. What about this nothingness? I heard you say it will destroy everything. You can't get to it. It's in space. Take me. No chance, you big bully. Oh, then? Reluctantly, Janet led Hamilton inside the observatory to the telescope. This is it. What is? The telescope. 
It's a portal into the galaxy. And it only works with the girls? Leave her alone, Hamilton. A nasty laugh erupted from the back of Hamilton's throat. <laughs> Take me to the nothingness. We're destroying Clark's pathetic dreams for good. I can't let you do this. You don't have a choice. <laughs> Janet grudgingly lined up the telescope with the coordinates. Hamilton watched as blue light blazed from Silly and she rose into the air. First Clark, and then every pathetic dream will be eradicated from this repulsive town. All three of them were sucked through the telescope. Odin batted his wings, wondering where everyone had gone. Rushing, flying, spinning through blinding light, they emerged amidst a brilliant nebula, shining purple and blue. Hamilton couldn't believe his eyes. They slowed down in their flight, coming to a stop in front of a cluster of weak stars, sparkling faintly against the deep black. This is it, the Clark Star. Hamilton looked up to the light. He held Clark's dream rock in his hand. Where is it? Where is the nothingness? Show yourself! The nothingness crackled, taunting them. A black hole ruptured the star system, its darkness oozing towards them. You were friends with my father once. Can you not respect an old friend's dying wish? Your father was no friend of mine! Hamilton launched the rock towards the nothingness, the gravity of the black hole sucking it inwards, soon to be gone forever. We can't lose the dream rock! Silly propelled herself towards the nothingness, bright light beaming from her symbol towards it. Her light battled against the darkness. She reached for Stuart's dream rock, stretching so that her fingertips almost grasped it. I'm almost... I... The power of the nothingness was too strong. It pulled the rock deeper into the abyss, pulling Silly inside with it. Silly closed her hand over the dream rock, holding it to her before the nothingness swallowed her whole. Janet and Hamilton felt a sudden pull backwards, hauling them unwillingly back to Earth. Janet woke up on the observatory floor. Hamilton was lying unconscious beside her, the notebook free from his hand. Janet grasped for the book. She entered every combination into the telescope again and again, willing it to teleport her back into space so she could find Silly. She pored over the final riddles. Oscar Wilde taught lessons key, if you find the worst in me. Doubt thou the stars are fire, doubt truth to be a liar, but never doubt I love. Shakespeare. Janet turned sharply, holding the notebook tightly to her. Hamlet, I believe. Not my favourite, but dramatic. What happened between you and my father? It doesn't concern you. It was a long time ago. Then why do you still hate him so much? Your father is a thief and a liar. My father was a good man. Not to me. We had a plan to go into business together. Hamilton Coates. He told me he wanted to earn his success through hard work, not clinging to his family's coattails. I had a beautiful fiancé, a new business, and a best friend I thought I could trust with the world. But he took it all. He embarrassed me in front of the whole town and stole my precious Margaret. Margaret? My mother? I loved her so very much. A strange silence fell between them. Always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them so much. Dad always used to say that after an argument. Of course he would parrot Oscar Wilde. Janet looked Hamilton straight in the eyes, a smile spreading over her face. What's wrong with you? Oscar Wilde taught lessons key. If you find the worst in me, I think Father wanted you to tell me about his mistakes and ask for your forgiveness. 
Why did he get to be happy while I suffered? I'm sorry. He should have apologized himself. Pride can do awful things to a man. I've let myself become so twisted by heat. Oh, what I did to your friend, I'll never forgive myself. Ernest, what is it you really want? What we all want, to be loved. A small tear trickled down Hamilton's cheek. He reached into his coat pocket. It crashed through my window the night he died. Something in me knew it was important. The brilliant light from his dream rock poured into the dark observatory. The light glowed, bigger, brighter, shooting up towards the sky. Odin, what's the matter, boy? Odin! A gust of wind burst open the observatory doors. Paper flew through the air and a dazzling blue light shot out from the eyepiece of the telescope. Silly appeared, vivid and sparkling. Missed me? Silly floated down to the ground, and Janet threw her arms around her friend. How did you get back? I had a little bit of help from an old friend. Even helped put Clark's rock back in its place. Plus, there's still two more dream rocks to return. Janet looked at Hamilton, who was transfixed by his glowing dream rock. It's time. Very well. Janet looked at her own dream rock, not yet lit. I don't know what my dreams are. Look up. I just want my father back. The rock stayed unlit. Silly moved over to the telescope and motioned for Janet to look through the eyepiece. She peered up at a black sky twinkling with tiny stars. Your father is up there, Janet, watching over the stars and watching over you. He's so, so proud of the brilliant, the woman, brilliant you've woman you've become. I know you'll do great things, Janet, inspiring others as you have always inspired me. Be brave and live your life with adventure and love, knowing that I'll always be with you. I love you, my wonderful daughter. He also said Hamlet, whatever that means. <laughs> Janet laughed as tears spilled down her cheeks. I just wanted to know he was proud of me. Finally, her dream rock lit up, light filling the room. Silly smiled broadly, knowing her work here was done. Set up the coordinates, Captain. Uh, silly, I'm so sorry for what I did to you. Would you ever forgive a foolish old man? Would you like to come with us, Ernest? Oh, would I? Janet positioned the telescope for the final time. The three of them launched back through the telescope and into the Milky Way. Janet savoured every eyeful of swirling pink gases and burning stars, knowing this would probably be the last she ever saw of them. She threw her arms wide. She felt tiny and huge at the same time, an important part of something much bigger than just her. Hamilton spun, free in the wakelessness. His hat slipped from his grasp and he tumbled after it, giggling and happy for the first time in years. <laughs> Silly replaced Hamilton's rock. Finally, she reached out to Janet's star, returning the glowing dream rock to its rightful place. Janet watched as the constellation flickered into life, glistening with promise and hope. She'd never seen anything quite so beautiful. The nothingness. They saw the nothingness, swirling menacingly in the distance. Think we can take it? Light flew out from Silly's chest into the nothingness. Her light clashed against the darkness, strong and bright. But it wasn't enough. The nothingness crept towards them. No, it's not working! Take my hand! As Janet took Silly's hand, her light strengthened, but it still wasn't no. enough. Hamilton reached out for Silly's hand, and light radiated from her, so powerful, it shrank the nothingness until it was nothing at all. The star seekers burst from the nothingness. Alpha, Psi, Theta, Phi, all of the star seekers were free once again. Sigma moved towards them. Thank you for saving us, dreamers. You did it. 
We did it. Is the nothingness gone? Well, it's gone for now. Thanks to you. That's why I've got to stay here with all the other Star Seekers and keep watch over the dreams. What will you do, Janet? Well, there's no point living in the grief of the past when you have the gift of the present. Another of your father's quotes, Janet? More of a conceptualization. My dad taught me to live with adventure and love. I'm about to marry the love of my life. And I know we'll never be without dreams. Lord Hamilton quietly wiped a tear from his cheek. Are you okay, Ernest? Oh, I must be allergic to all this space dust. They took each other's hands one last time, flying back through the cosmos and home to the observatory. Silly was gone when they returned, but Janet smiled to herself, knowing she was up there in the sky, protecting her precious dreams. Farewell, Janet. One month later, Janet was married to James Tate in a special evening ceremony under the stars. The McDougall Brothers bookshop filled with new customers with the introduction of a new young reader scheme, led by a young apprentice who wrote an epic fantasy about glowing space rocks. Stuart Clark was elected MP for Paisley and served dutifully for the town. Paisley regained its former colour and became a happy community once more. Lord Hamilton and his raven Odin moved to Ireland to start afresh. He married a brilliant woman, Pamela, with whom he had three children. The Coates family opened the Thomas Coates Memorial Baptist Church on Wellmeadow Street in 1894 in Thomas' loving memory. When electric trains were introduced in the 1890s, the world finally came to recognise Robert Davidson as the oldest living electrician and a pioneer for their times. Janet and James lived happily, travelling widely and reading many, many books. Upon her death in 1918, Janet set up a new writing prize in her husband's name. The James Tate Black Memorial Book Prize honours outstanding new literary works. Thanks to Janet, the awards still run to this date, with four recipients having gone on to win Nobel Prizes. The award celebrated 100 years in 2019 with an extra special prize, the Janet Coates Black Prize, awarded in her honour. And me? I'll be up here with the rest of the Star Seekers, watching over your dreams. <laughs>